So uh, the links and us. So why why talk about links uh, here in Scotland uh, and the UK when we don't even have them? What's it all about? Well, as I'm sure many of you know, that over the last say decade or so, there has been a growing discussion about reintroducing the Eurasian links to Scotland and indeed elsewhere in the UK. And what I'm noticing as an observer is that that discussion, whilst it's mounting, it's undoubtedly becoming quite polarised. And both in terms of the proponents and the opponents, I would say there is some you know, lack of knowledge and lack of understanding of the species. So I think it's really important that we have a good grounding in the species ecology and crucially, how that species interacts with us, our species, uh, across modern Europe. And so, uh, and, and as Kevin mentioned, I've recently gone into that subject uh, in the course of a book called The Links in Us, which is really exploring that dynamic between links uh, and, and people in this very busy continent of ours. So like I say, there is a mounting discussion about links reintroduction. There's been uh, various landscapes across the UK have been mentioned as potential links reintroduction landscapes. Um, but what I'm finding, like I say, lots of assumptions being made about lynx ecology and how they might interact with us. And inadvertently, what people are often describing to me when they think they're describing lynx behaviour is a, pretty much describing a wolf or they're describing a fox. And of course, lynx are very different beasts with very different ecologies and relationships with us. So I'm going to start this talk, um, naturally enough, with a photograph of a toddler and a lawnmower. Quite a better place to start. So, of course, this toddler is in fact me when I'm about one year old, uh, and I'm doing what I so often did when I was around at my grandmother's uh, house in the back garden, was showing an unhealthy, or, or rather a weird fascination for her lawnmower. And no doubt my engineer father and my engineer grandfather were thinking, yeah, that's my boy, brilliant, he's going to grow up like us. And a Meccano set was bought for me, but ultimately never really played with. And of course, I would go on to the demonstrate neither an interest in nor an aptitude in anything remotely technical or practical. So what was going on there? It was a bit of a mystery. Well, it wasn't until much later on in life when I was clearing out my grandmother's shed that I stumbled across the, gla the grass collection bucket from the lawnmower. And it turns out it was a qual cast lawnmower, a lot like this one, except the maker's logo on hers was on the grass collection bucket. And of course, the qual cast maker's logo is this. It's a spotty, golden coloured cat. And I've got no doubt in my mind now that what the one-year-old me was so fascinated by wasn't the lawnmower as such, it was this maker's logo, the spotty golden coloured cat. So I've um, no idea how these things work, um, whether I was born with an innate uh, fascination for spotty golden coloured cats, or whether indeed uh, my grandmother's light, uh, lawnmower acted as a bit of a lightning rod and developed my fascination, and whether there's several hundred people here tonight tuning in simply because of my granny's lawnmower. We'll never know, I guess. So before I go on to talk about the cats themselves, uh, I need to talk about another person. It's the bigger of these two people. Uh, it's a French friend of mine called Laurent Gélin. When I say friend, I use that term advisedly. He's, uh, he's annoyingly good looking and suave, uh, he's got a beautiful wife and a golden-haired child and a, a lovely idyllic lifestyle in Switzerland. And he's annoyingly good with a camera, particularly long lens stuff, but perhaps even more so with camera traps. It is all very annoying. So perhaps you, like me, have, have you know, tried camera trapping a number of times yourself. I know I've tried to get wildcats here in the Cairngorms uh, to very mixed success. Uh, and typically what I end up getting, of course, is a, an out-of-focus back end of a Labrador disappearing uh, off to the left. Uh, that is very typical. So when Laurent goes into the mountains of Switzerland trying to get camera trap photographs of Europe's most enigmatic large carnivore, he gets photographs that look like this. So you can see he's very annoying. This is a beautifully lit pin sharp animal going about its natural business in the wild in the mountains of Switzerland. So uh, but in all seriousness, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm very fortunate, very honored to be able to work with Laurent uh, both in terms of the images for the book, The Links and Us, um, but also for many of the images in this talk, all the links images that you'll see tonight were taken by Laurent. So onto the cats themselves then. So this is the Eurasian lynx here. It's one of four species of lynx that are found throughout the world. There are two in the New World. So there's the, the Canada lynx, which is found in Alaska, Canada, and the US Rockies. There's the bobcat, which is found in Mexico, uh, the coterminous United States and in the southern parts of Canada. And here on this side of the Atlantic, we have two species, the Iberian lynx, which as many of you may know, is an endangered species found in Spain and Portugal. And then there's the Eurasian lynx. 
which occurs more widely across Europe and indeed right across Asia to the Pacific coast. And they've all got the same basic lynx body plan. They're all quite leggy. They've got short, stubby tails. Uh, they've got the distinctive tufted ears and they've got that furry face as well. And, and they're very often quite spotted. So they all look broadly similar. But the Eurasian lynx is quite different from the other three in two key aspects. One is in prey choice. And the second thing is in the size of the animal, which is very much related to prey choice. So the Eurasian lynx is quite a lot bigger than the other three species. The other three species are typically coming in at something like 10 to 12 kilos, whereas the Eurasian lynx is double that, 20, 25 kilos, sometimes a bit more than that. And of course, that's reflected in its choice of prey. The other three species are typically looking for smaller game, things like rabbits, um, hares, birds, small mammals, that sort of thing. Whereas the Eurasian lynx is a big game hunter. And right across its very broad geographical range, the one species that's really interested in is the rhodia. Rhodia represents the ideal size of prey for a lynx. It's about the same size as a lynx, 20, 25 kilos. So there's enough food there to last a lynx several days once it's killed one. But equally, it's not so big or so dangerous that it can't be overpowered. Uh, there's a much you know, reduced risk of injury than if they were trying to tackle something a lot bigger. So it's the ideal size. So we do find that the road here, where they're available, is the number one favourite prey animal of the Eurasian lynx. But they are capable of killing much larger animals, and certainly in parts of Central Europe, they do hunt and kill chamois, which are quite a bit bigger than roe deer. Uh, we know from the Nordic countries that they will hunt semi-domestic reindeer. And even in eastern Poland, in the likes of the Yellow Forest, lynx do routinely kill red deer, and red deer are big animals in Poland compared certainly to here in Scotland. Now it's interesting, um, their, their prey uh, or their, their choice of, of roe deer is, is pretty much according to its availability. They'll take young, they'll take uh, males, they'll take females, but when it comes to red deer, their predation is much more focused in on the calves, uh, but they will take adult females, but they do completely avoid taking the stags. The stags are just too big, too powerful, and of course they've got those antlers, which make them a dangerous proposition. But they are capable of taking bigger beasts than road here. I guess it's really important to understand how lynx hunt. So lynx are not cursing, uh, cursing predators. They're not like a cheetah that has a tremendous burst of speed that can sprint uh, after prey really, really fast uh, and trip them up and, and hunt them down. They're not like a pack of wolves. The wolves are imbued with tremendous stamina and can run literally for miles after a group of animals and in so doing select uh, perhaps the weakest and the slowest uh, and prey on that. Lynx don't do that. They're an ambush hunter. So they need to get close enough to launch a surprise attack. And it all needs to be over in a matter of seconds and a matter of meters. Consequently, and given we're talking about road deer here, woodland is a really key habitat for them. It's where the roe deer are hanging in or around, uh, and there's certainly lots of ambush cover, whether it's standing timber, falling timber, shrubbery, that sort of thing. So woodland is a key habitat for them. The other thing I think we also need to, to grasp in the UK is just how much space a lynx population needs. I mean, we're used to thinking of smaller predators in the UK, like wildcats, pine martens, foxes, that sort of thing. But lynx need huge areas. They're territorial animals, they're strictly territorial, so a male lynx won't tolerate another male lynx in its home range. Similarly, a female won't tolerate another female in her home range, although one male, um, because their home ranges tend to be larger, might encompass two or three female home ranges, so he might have to pick up the ladies when it comes to the mating season. But generally speaking, they need very large, typically quite well wooded landscapes. And exactly the size of their home range, and therefore you know, the density of, that, uh, of links that a landscape can uh, support, is, is determined by two things. First of all, gender. I mentioned that uh, males have got bigger home ranges than females. And the second determinant is the availability of prey. So if you're in an environment where it's quite prey rich, there's lots of deer, then the links can get what they need out of a relatively tight area. They don't need to have a huge home range. But equally, if you go further north, perhaps into the Nordic countries where there's less solar energy, less vegetative growth, fewer herbivores are out, fewer deer, then in order to get what they need, they have to have a much larger home range. And in fact, the largest recorded home range for a wild feed so far was a male lynx recorded in the north of Norway. And its home range was over 4,000 square kilometers, which is getting on for about the same size as the Cairngorms National Park, the biggest national park in the UK, one of the biggest in Europe, 
which covers 6% of Scotland. So you get some idea of the, of the scale of that particular Linsys home range. So it is quite typical to see very big home ranges in the Nordic countries. If you go further south into places like Switzerland, where this photograph was taken, then home ranges are quite a lot smaller because they're far more prey around. So it might be something like 100 square kilometres for a female and 200 square kilometres for a male. So like I say, quite a lot smaller, but that's still nevertheless really big areas that we're talking about. And those could be an order of magnitude, perhaps even two orders of magnitude greater than the sorts of predators that we're used to thinking about here uh, in the UK, such as wild cats, foxes, pine martins, etc. So a very low density animal and not one that you're really ever going to be tripping over uh, uh, in the landscape. Which kind of begs the question, well, how on earth do they find each other if they're running around uh, you know, a, a sort of big empty landscape like that? Well, perhaps this photograph uh, gives you a clue, because obviously they need to find each other when it comes to the mating season. And they do communicate uh, with one another using scent marking, both in terms of uh, communicating to, to links of the same gender to say, hey, this is my bit, stay out of here, find your own home range. Or indeed to communicate to members of the opposite sex when it comes to the mating season, to you know, advertise your availability. Another thing that, uh, that particularly females do is, particularly in those cold, crisp winter nights when it's dead still and sound can travel a long way, they might loudly yowl from the mountainside and that noise can travel quite some way and it's a way of advertising to the males that she's ready to mate, come and get me sort of thing. So they, they are capable of finding each other despite operating at very low densities. And of course, um, when they do uh, find each other, that, that uh, mating season typically takes place in the late uh, winter, um, say March time. Uh, the males and the females are together literally for only a day or two at the most. The male has no other part to play in the raising of any kittens. Uh, she will be pregnant for a couple of months and then she will retire to a natal den uh, in the spring to have her kittens, typically two or three, sometimes four. It's somewhere like this, a rocky day in a cleft, a, a rock fissure. Uh, possibly even an abandoned fox's earth or badger set, where she will raise those animals, those kittens, in relative safety. Um, and she'll keep them in there for a few weeks. Of course, the downside about being so stationary uh, with the kittens like that is that in that particular part of the home range, the prey start to get very alert and very wise to her presence. They can see her or hear her or smell her. So the, the, the prey become harder to hunt right at the time of the year when she really needs to up her kill rate because she's got these kittens to feed. So she, after a few weeks of them being stashed away in a natal den, she'll start to move them around to more temporary dens as she moves around her home range to take advantage of less alert prey. And of course, ultimately, they will, they will wean off the milk and start eating meat. They will follow her around and watch her while she's hunting and pick up all the tricks of the trade about, about being a superb forest predator. But after about 10 months or so, she comes into the season again. It's the mating season again. She doesn't want them around. So she kicks them out uh, and they uh, then enter a phase, what's known as the sub-adult phase, when they're, I suppose, kind of awkward teenagers. They're not quite adults. They're not quite kids anymore. Uh, and they've got a lot of, of lot of skills to learn very quickly. And it's a very dangerous time for Lynx. Uh, they're kicked out by the mother. They have to go and find uh, an unoccupied home range. They're typically only half size. They might only be nine or 10 kilos at this time of their life. They've yet to, they've got to overpower prey that could be twice the size of them. Uh, and they may well have linear distances of tens of kilometers, perhaps even hundreds of kilometers to make to find an unoccupied home range all the while dodging aggressive adult lynx and having to cross motorways perhaps and railways and dodge humans and dogs. So it is a very trying time for them and unfortunately mortality levels for both kittens and sub-adults are, are very high. But if they can survive all that and settle down in an unoccupied home range, call it home, uh, then the cycle begins again. Typically uh, females are becoming sexually mature about two, two and a half years old and males a little bit older at three years old and the cycle begins again. So that's lynx ecology uh, in a nutshell. Um, what about this all-important relationship between lynx and us? Because that really is critically important if we're going to be having any discussion about reintroducing this species. Well, the relationship between people and lynx is a very old one. In fact, it'll be much older than this medieval painting, which is from the 14th century. It's a book called The Livre de Chasse, a French hunting book. And what it shows, of course, is that the, the nobility on, on horseback with their retainers and the hounds out hunting a lynx 
and obviously the links is, has come a cropper. It's not going to end well for the links, and that I think is a very typical story for links in that relationship with uh, with people. If only it had been as sensible as the wildcat in the background and shot up that tree. But and one of the interesting things, and no doubt the artist was a very talented person, is that they, uh, you know, the, the painting shows a long tail, a bit like a leopard, which I think. It, Whilst this animal was undoubtedly known to some people, it wasn't all that well known. This is an animal that it's always been rather cryptic and doesn't feature all that strongly in human culture. We've got lots of morality tales and fairy tales of bears and wolves, but just virtually nothing about lynx. It's not an animal that we're used to seeing depicted or even seeing in the wild very often at all. But like I say, that relationship with the lynx goes a long way back. And no doubt from the dawn of history, we've been hunting lynx both as food, because you can eat them, we know that they were served up at the Congress of Vienna at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Apparently it tastes like venison. Um, but certainly we were hunting them for their fur. And particularly in the wintertime, that fur is a warm, luxuriant fur. And we know that by the time we get to the Renaissance era, uh, the, the rich and wealthy in society are very often painted wearing lynx fur cloaks and garments. So it's clearly a very valuable item by the time we get into the 15th and 16th centuries. So people were hunting them for fun. But at the same time in this scene, the animal was probably also getting hunted for its fur and quite possibly its meat. And at the same time, there might have been an opportunity to, to get rid of a pest, an animal that was competing with us for the deer that we want to hunt, or indeed uh, the livestock that we're dependent on to, uh, for our family to survive. So there's an element uh, of persecution perhaps going on as well as exploiting a resource. So a fairly unhappy relationship, I would say, from the lynx's point of view, which does have effects at the population level and at a, a, a sort of perceptible geographical level. So hopefully what you can see here in this map are three shades of green, light, mid and dark. And taken together, what they show is the natural geographical distribution of lynx in the past, from the north of Iberia, the British Isles, right across the continent of Europe, including the Nordic countries, into Russia, and all the way past the Urals to the Pacific coast of Russia, down into the Middle East uh, and the Himalayas. So an incredibly broad geographical distribution. But due to human pressures, and I mentioned direct killing in the previous slide, but also what's of course going on as humans, as we become more and more numerous, more and more technologically advanced, we start to have more and more of an influence on the environment around us. So we're adapting it to suit our needs. We want timber, we want farmland, so we're clearing the forest. We're perhaps over-exploiting deer populations. We're perhaps squeezing deer populations by having lots of livestock out there. And of course, the livestock are perhaps nibbling away at the young trees uh, and no doubt creating another uh, cause or, or source of persecution. So by the time we get to 1800, the lynx population has contracted into the mid-green and dark green areas. So in central and western Europe, you're only finding Eurasian lynx by 1800 in the more thinly populated mountainous parts of the continent. And then actually by the time really the, the, the persecution and the environmental degradation really speeds up in the 19th century because of technological advances uh, and a determination to rid landscapes of animals uh, like lynx or so problematic predators. So by the time we get to 1950, uh, the lynx is only found in the dark green areas, you know, the, the kind of thinly populated the mountainous parts of the east of the big forest complexes, so like the, the Balkan mountains, the Carpathians, the huge forest areas of Russia and neighboring countries and, and the northern parts of the Scandinavian peninsula. So it's been pretty disastrous. This is the low point for Eurasian lynx by 1950. They've been wiped out from the whole of Central and Western Europe. So a bad story. However, it doesn't stay like this. From the middle of the 20th century onwards, things start to change. Humans start to move about the continent or even leave the continent. We start to see uh, changes to the way that the countryside is managed. We start to see attitudes change towards wildlife in general, predators in particular. Uh, there's a greater understanding of the interconnectivity of nature uh, and of course the scientific discipline of ecology is born. And perhaps people start to think, well, maybe it was wrong to rid predators in the landscape. Maybe they had a job to do in helping control um, uh, herbivores. And of course, by this point, deer populations are recovering rather well, sometimes subject to reintroductions by, by hunters. Um, so deer populations are recovering, forest is expanding, Europe's forests uh, grow by a third over the course of the 20th century. So by the time we get to the 1970s, there's a growing movement to restore links to landscapes that only a matter of decades beforehand 
people were paying good money in the form of bounties to rid the landscapes of these animals. So we see people taking lynx from further eastern Europe, such as the Carpathian Mountains, and releasing them into some of the, the areas of suitable habitat, typically uh, in the hillier parts of Western Europe, and trying to right that environmental wrong that took place just a matter of decades beforehand. And so the map of Europe, for, from the lynx's point of view, has changed quite a bit. We've seen considerable natural expansion in the Nordic countries. So they were pretty much extinct in Finland, but they covered pretty much the whole country. Uh, there was a very small population uh, shared between Norway and Sweden, which is now spread right across the peninsula. And there's been expansion in the Carpathians. And then we have these orangey red areas in the central western parts of Europe, where there has been uh, the introduction, a series of reintroductions have taken place right across these orange areas. So the, the parts of uh, the Swiss Alps, the Jura Mountains of uh, Switzerland and France, uh, the, the border area between Bavaria and the Czech Republic and the Harz Mountains of Germany, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, the, the Palatinian forest uh, reintroduction on Germany's border with France is pretty much still ongoing. It's a very recent reintroduction. So it's happening right up into the present day. There have been failures as well as successes, and of course we can learn from both. Um, for example, there was um, a reintroduction took place in the Gran Paradiso National Park in Italy, in the Italian Alps in the 1970s, and it failed because it only released two animals. The fact they were both male probably didn't help much either. So like I say, we can learn from the failures as much as we can from the successes. So the lynx is no longer an animal that's restricted to the far-flung uninhabited parts of the continent. It's now an animal that lives cheek by jowl with humans in some pretty busy uh, human environments. As this photograph by Laurent in the Swiss mountains, uh, the Swiss Jura mountains demonstrates rather nicely. These are not wilderness areas. The Jura mountains are very busy uh, um, forested landscapes that are used intensively by people. There's lots of towns and villages, there's roads and railway lines, there's hunting, uh, there's farming, there's forestry, there's lots going on. In fact, the human population density of the Jura Mountains in Switzerland is about 120 people per square kilometre, 120. The Highland region of Scotland has nine people per square kilometre. So you get the idea, lynx don't need uninhabited wildernesses. If we're prepared to live alongside them, if there are tolerant human attitudes, they can adapt to being in amongst us in high numbers. But it's not all plain sailing and it's not all good news. Unfortunately, uh, persecution, illegal killing is a fact of life or indeed a fact of death for lynx right across Europe. And it doesn't really seem to matter whether it's a rich country or a poor country or a country that's got a good police force and judiciary system, or whether even it's a country that has uh, legal hunting allowed, that has an open season on lynx, you still get illegal killing of lynx. And what I hope you can see here is a scene from a pathology lab, a veterinary pathology lab in Switzerland, and they're looking at the carcass uh, of, a, of a lynx, they're scanning that, and you might be able to see little dots on the computer screen there showing that this animal has been illegally killed with a shotgun. So unfortunately, uh, illegal persecution does happen. And that's largely, uh, I suppose, driven by conflicts, a dissatisfaction among some people about lynx being in the landscape. Now, we Brits are probably tempted to assume that the number one conflict in Europe between people and the Asian lynx is going to be about livestock. Well, actually, it's not. Uh, it's actually about deer, because when you think about it, they're a, a year-round predator of deer. That's what we do. Deer in, or sorry, weekend, week out, they're killing deer. Sheep, on the other hand, which we often assume will be the number one conflict, is a much more variable um, land use. You know, there are landscapes where lynx are, but there are no sheep. There are landscapes where lynx are, but there are sheep, but they're, they're kind of protected um, from uh, the lynx. And so there's very little in the way of predation. So it's very variable in space and time, that whole subject uh, with uh, lynx and sheep. So going into a little bit more detail about the sheep then, and obviously this photograph so shows a flock of sheep in a pasture. And of course, flocking is an anti-predator behavior. Getting together with all your chums is safety in numbers. There's more noses, more ears, more eyes on the lookout for any uh, predators. And of course, they're in an open pasture. There's very little in the way of ambush cover here. So this is a situation where it looks as very unlikely to approach those sheep. Uh, because it's going to get rumbled, it's going to, it's going to get noticed very early on, and the chances of a successful hunt are very limited. And like I say, very little in the way of ambush cover. So flocking is an anti-predator behaviour. 
but we do see quite a dramatic difference in the relationship between lynx and sheep across the continent of Europe. So in places like Romania or, or Slovakia and the Carpathian Mountains, where they've never lost their lynx, they've never lost their wolves or the bears, they've always had these large carnivores, the, the shepherding is what we might call quite traditional. Um, they, they've never lost the ability to live alongside these large carnivores, and they use measures such as these livestock guarding dogs, or they might have 24-7 shepherding or corralling the sheep at night. And to be honest, uh, it's the wolves and the bears that the shepherds are really worried about. Because if we've got three or four of these 40 kilogram livestock guarding dogs, there's no way a 20 kilogram lynx is going to go anywhere near that. Now, it could be that a, a pack of six or seven wolves might outfight or outsmart the livestock guarding dogs. And so the shepherds are still using the odd sheep to wolves. One big grumpy bear, again, they will um, fend off the, the, the dogs and they will take some sheep. So it is the wolves and the bears that they're, they're most worried about. But these livestock guarding dogs uh, are very effective. And I don't know if you've ever been to Romania and to the Carpathians, but they are quite terrifying beasts. They, uh, these are bear infested mountains and I'm far more worried about the livestock guarding dogs. In fact, I think three of them chased me one day when I was on a mountain bike. Uh, it's an exhilarating experience, I'll say that much. So, but yes, nevertheless, very effective at protecting sheep from uh, lynx. The other end of the spectrum, uh, in terms of a, of a scale of a, of a problem between lynx and sheep, so coming from the Carpathians, where there's virtually no sheep lost at all to lynx, despite the healthy populations of lynx living in those mountains, the opposite end of the spectrum is Norway. And Norway is a very unique story. Uh, and funnily enough, uh, it being the worst case scenario, it is the one that is sometimes referred to by opponents of the idea of lynx reintroduction in the UK and given as an example of what would happen in the UK if we were to reintroduce them uh, in this country. But I need, to, I need to spend some time explaining why Norway is as bad as it is and why it's not always a very good comparison to make with us here in Scotland. So Norway is a very long way ahead of being the worst case scenario in Europe for that relationship. They're paying out something like 3 million euros worth of compensation to sheep farmers because of losses to lynx. So it's not an insignificant amount of money. Now the second worst case scenario for the relationship between lynx and sheep, you know, or out of all the European countries that have lynx, and there are lots of countries that have lynx these days, the second worst case scenario is Sweden which is maybe not terribly surprising given it's just across a very long border with Norway. But interestingly, Sweden actually has four times as many lynx as Norway, but doesn't have four times as big a problem. In fact, if we look at the compensation payouts, they're not paying 3 million euros, nothing like it. They're not even paying 300,000 euros. They're paying out something like 37,000 euros. It's a tiny proportion of what the Norwegians are paying out, yet they have far more links. So what's going on there? And remember, this is the second worst case scenario in the whole of Europe. So what is going on there? Well, first, the key thing is that in Norway, the sheep are being grazed in the forest. Two and a half million sheep at the end of the spring at the, in the lower ground are put into the woodland and they're allowed to graze by themselves with no uh, livestock garden dogs, no intensive shepherding. And over the course of the summer, they work their way up the hill through the woods. And by the end of the summer, they pop out into the alpine pastures. And before autumn really kicks in, they're taken off back down to the low ground again. But during that time that all these sheep are in the woods, because it's very difficult, story, rocky terrain, as I'm sure those of you who've been in Norway will attest. Uh, and of course, it's full of ambush cover. Uh, it's where the lynx live. Uh, and actually, sheep can't occur as a flock in that environment. Uh, they have to occur singly or in small groups. And they're sort of replicating the behavior, this, the distribution of roe deer in that environment. So, and actually, there are very few roe deer around in these Norwegian woodlands compared to here in Scotland. So lots of ambush cover, not very many deer, lots of sheep. You can imagine, you know, why there's a problem in Norway, which just doesn't exist to anything like that scale anywhere else in Europe. And actually, it's not just lynx. We know that in some parts of Norway, it's wolves, it's bears, it's wolverines, and certainly more widely, it's things like foxes and golden eagles. They are all known to be significant predators uh, of sheep uh, during those summer seasons when they're so vulnerable to predation. And in fact, interestingly, there was a study done a couple of years ago by a Norwegian government-funded team of scientists that really looks at all the data that have been accrued over 18 years, the worth of scientific research, trying to get a better understanding of this relationship between lynx and sheep. And they found, they came to a couple of really interesting conclusions. 
the one thing they noticed was no matter how many sheep you had in the woodland, if you had lynx in the woodland and you had lots of sheep, but you also had quite a healthy deer population, and, and the Norwegians were saying that a high deer population of, of roe was something like four per square kilometre, then you lost virtually no sheep, even if, even if sheep were, were really quite numerous in the woodland. Now, four per square kilometre might be a high number by Norwegian standards, but that's actually a very low number by certainly Scottish standards, where 10, 15 or 20 woodland deer per square kilometre is certainly very common. Even if we did graze huge amounts of sheep in woodland, which we don't. The other thing that the scientists concluded, they scratched their heads, they did the maths and they said, hold on, we don't think lynx are capable of killing the number of sheep that are being compensated for. You think about, hold on, this is a compensation scheme, it's public money, it, these people are Scandinavian, they're pretty bright, uh, this will be a pretty rigorous system. Well, it turns out it's not. Now, in many European countries with a compensation scheme, there's a pretty rigorous form of verification. You need a trained uh, specialist will come in, look at bite marks, look at scratch marks, take DNA swabs, and be, uh, and be pretty clear what has happened to that sheep, what has killed it. In Norway, as many as 97% of compensation claims for lynx killing sheep are not subject to verification. And of course, we're talking about a very rugged, pretty dangerous uh, wooded landscape that's got foxes, eagles, wolverines, bears and wolves in it. You can imagine how uh, uh, animals just end up getting lost, falling off cliffs, moving on other people's land, taken out by other predators, or possibly human nature being what it is, the system just gets abused because it is abusable. And the Norwegians would admit that their system of uh, livestock compensation is far from perfect. So really interesting to sort of dig down into some of the numbers from Norway. And like I say, that is by far and away the worst case scenario. Uh, you know, 3 million euros instead of 37,000 uh, in Sweden, and Sweden is the second worst case. And perhaps uh, if we go move further south and look at Switzerland, Switzerland grazes um, its sheep typically in open pastures, where there are pretty high densities of deer, more akin to what you would see in the UK. Uh, and the lynx are pretty uh, numerous, there's something like 300 lynx in Switzerland these days. They're typically losing anywhere between 20 and 50 uh, sheep per year in the entire country to those 300 lynx. So um, sheep killing by lynx, the introduced lynx in Switzerland, is pretty unusual, it's pretty rare, it's small scale, it's localised and it can be managed. And they manage it for a, for a fairly rigorous compensation scheme. So when it does happen, the farmer is compensated. There are means to try and prevent the likelihood of predation, uh, providing livestock guarding animals. And it's not just dogs. You can use donkeys, you can use llamas. They all work very well, apparently, uh, when fending off lynx. Uh, and also, if a, if a lynx becomes what's known as a problem animal, i.e. it kills 15 sheep in a year, it's designated a problem animal, a license is given to a state game warden, and that animal will be shot. So there is the ability to lethally control problem animals. Although they haven't had to enact that in Switzerland since 2003. It's such a long time since they had a problem animal uh, killing sheep. And of course, the, the population now is much bigger. The lynx population is much bigger now than it was back in 2003. So I think it was important just to dwell on that for a wee while. So there's, there's, there's lots of dangers. Um, people are, you know, are killing lynx legally, illegally, and sometimes even well-meaning people can be inadvertently deadly for lynx in a, a, a busy continent with three quarters of a billion people, typically trying to get from A to B as quickly as possible. Um, you know, it's a continent that's crisscrossed with railway lines and busy roads which seem to be getting ever busier, and wider and faster. Uh, so really difficult. And this lynx here in Switzerland is about to cross a railway line. Um, and it, it may not get to the other side. We know that road mortality is a significant cause of death for lynx in places like Switzerland. I know that in, in recent weeks in France and the French side of the Jura Mountains, there's been a, a number of lynx deaths on the road. So it is a significant cause of mortality. And even if lynx get to the side of the road uh, and decide not to cross it because it's too scary, they turn back uh, and effectively that road is causing habitat fragmentation. And if that, say, male dispersing sub adult ends up settling back next to its mother's home range, then who knows what might, might happen in future breeding seasons. It could lead to all sorts of genetic problems. And certainly that's something that uh, uh, an EU life project is seeking to address in, the, in Slovenia and Croatia at the moment. They're boosting the population 
uh, they are using more links to add to the links that were released in the 1970s to try and boost the gene pool. It's felt that too few links were released in the 1970s, only six were released. Uh, and we know that there were siblings in there, and there were, there were mother and offspring in there. So um, broadening the gene pool. So we know that having a, a very limited gene pool can be a bad thing, but Slovenian and Croatian population stopped expanding a long time ago. So, but, you know, I, I've kind of dropped with some of the problems here, and it's, it's not all about problems or negativity. There are certainly opportunities from having links in the landscape. I mentioned before there are a year-round predator of woodland deer, week in, week out, that is what they're doing. And of course, that can be a good thing. If you've got an awful lot of, of woodland deer, they can cause problems for agriculture, they can cause problems for road safety, for forestry, etc., etc. So we're, we're kind of restoring an ecological process uh, of lynx predation on deer. And like I say, they'll typically kill one uh, about, uh, about once a week. Uh, they'll feed in it for four or five days. They'll typically do, as this one has, they will start feeding on the haunch. Uh, and then over the course of a few days, between bites of sleeping it off, they'll come back and eat the rest, uh, or much of the rest of the carcass. They'll, in between times, they'll maybe cover it up with leaf litter or snow to try and dissuade um, you know, scavengers from finding it. Uh, but that's what uh, the lynx essentially does. It's taking out large herbivores, and you could argue that there's a strong ecological and sometimes economic uh, need to do that. So, and of course, when it, when it does kill a deer, that carcass is available for a very wide range of scavengers. Um, and, you know, sometimes uh, the lynx have to actually increase their kill rates in response to the amount of scavenging that's going on. We know, for example, in Slovenia, when bears wake up from hibernation in, in the springtime, they're absolutely starving. They've got a fantastic sense of smell, and they can pick up on these uh, roe deer or shamrock carcasses that are lying around in the forest are half covered by leaf litter or snow, uh, and they will, uh, they will certainly feed on them, which forces the lynx to go and look elsewhere uh, and kill another deer to make up for that. And equally, wild boar may be another animal that is well capable of pushing a lynx off uh, a deer carcass like this. But obviously what we have here uh, is, uh, are some jays scavenging on the carcass in Switzerland, but we know a wide variety of birds uh, from little birds, such as members of the tip family that come down through bits and pieces of, of fat, uh, red kites, buzzards, eagles will all come down and scavenging carcasses uh, as well. And it's not just uh, birds, you know, uh, it's invertebrates as well. The, the little guys, uh, they do a hell of a lot of, of scavenging of these carcasses. And of course, themselves can act uh, as a food source for other birds and, and things like hedgehogs that might want to, to eat the invertebrates attracted by the carcass. But the number one vertebrate scavenger of lynx killed carcasses is this guy here, the red fox. And we know this from studies right across Europe that foxes are very commonly scavenging around, say, rodeo carcasses that have been killed by lynx. But this is a, a very dangerous pastime for foxes. Uh, they've got a choice of two strategies, really. They can wait until the lynx is completely finished with the carcass, um, and then it's safer, the lynx isn't around, but then, of course, all the best bits have gone. Or they could um, sneak in between feeding bouts where the lynx is still roughly around in the area, but there's still some plenty of meat left and, and, and risk uh, getting a, a better dinner, but at the expense of getting killed by the lynx. Because if the lynx comes back and finds a, a, a fox at the carcass, it really is game over. Uh, and so we know that this killing of foxes by lynx is a very common behaviour, again, widely reported around Europe. I think sometimes it's just about um, removing a competitor that's going to scavenge your, your dinner, uh, or sometimes they actually do eat um, the fox, which can be problematic because sometimes the lynx can pick up the sarcoptic mange that fox um, scavenge from, which is a skin parasite, which causes them to lose their hair. Uh, certainly a very bad news if you're living in a cold climate, for sure. But foxes do figure very prominently in lynx diet. And we often, I think, forget the effect that large carnivores can have, not just on large herbivores, but on smaller carnivores. And so if you look, um, and I've singled out here one diet study from the Swiss Jura, I picked on this one because it was a particularly uh, interesting study which spanned uh, a long time period, it was 10 years. It followed uh, a large number of links, 29 different links. Uh, and what the researchers did over those, the, that, those 10 years was they uh, followed with snow tracking uh, and radio tracking uh, the links um, uh, in, as they went about their, their daily lives and they picked up the feeding remains of the animals that the links had killed. And out of 617 prey animals, it was kind of as you expect in terms of, I've done a league table here, 
90% of what uh, the links were feeding on was roe deer and chamois. Interestingly, right to the bottom of the league table are two species that we're very concerned about here in Scotland, uh, the wildcat and the capricale. So yes, lynx can kill wildcats and they can kill capricale. The, the, the evidence is clear on that. But of course, what we're looking at, as you can see from the table, is one wildcat and one capricale being killed by 29 lynx over 10 years. Very, very low levels of predation. And I would argue that that's not going to have a significant effect at all on the wildcat and capricale populations. Now, what is interesting, at least I think so, is what is third on the league table, red fox. 37 red foxes were killed. So far more than the other smaller carnivores, including pine marten and badger and the wild cat, which they do very occasionally kill, but the red fox is much more routinely being taken out. And we know from studies elsewhere, in places like Sweden uh, and Finland, that that um, suppression of fox numbers can have trickle down effects uh, on other animals. We know, for example, from Sweden and Finland, that as the lynx would be colonized, landscapes that they had been uh, pushed out of, the researchers there found that populations of things like capricale, of black grouse, of mountain hare, actually rose, which might seem counterintuitive that the prey would go up as the predator comes back. But of course, what was really happening, according to the, the scientists, was the lynx were coming back and suppressing the foxes, making them less abundant. And of course, whilst the lynx might occasionally take a mountain hare or a woodland grouse, the foxes are much more frequent predators of those things. And the lynx was suppressing, suppressing the foxes to the benefit of the smaller populations. Now, that effect of lynx on foxes isn't necessarily going to be something that happens all over Europe. In fact, there's evidence to, or in fact, there's no evidence to suggest that that happens in places like Switzerland, where um, as lynx populations have risen, so have fox populations in response to previous uh, outbreaks of sarcoptic mange. But certainly further north, where fox populations uh, are reasonably low, unlike, say, in Switzerland, where they're very, very numerous, it does seem that lynx are able to suppress fox populations. And it seems uh, that fox densities in places like the Highlands are also pretty low and on a par with what we might find in the Nordic countries. So it could be uh, that the exploration of foxes might have some interesting ecological effects. Now, the, uh, the astute of you will notice that this is not a lynx. Uh, this, of course, uh, is a brown bear and her cub. Uh, this photograph was taken in Finland. Um, and what I've, I've really included this uh, to, to really give, the, to, to get across the idea of large carnivore tourism. Large carnivore tourism is definitely a thing. Um, and I, I guess over the developing discussion about lynx reintroduction in the UK, we've heard lots of bold claims about how lynx are going to bring in millions and squillions of pounds into the rural economy. Well, let, let's um, dive into that a little bit more. Large carnivore tourism, like I say, is definitely a thing. It's an expanding, growing business. There are more and more operators across Europe and indeed other parts of the world that do this, more and more customers and more and more uh, revenue being generated by it. And I myself have gone to Finland. Uh, I didn't take this photograph, but I certainly saw um, uh, brown bears um, from uh, a baited hide. Uh, the hide was essentially uh, a sweaty mosquito infested box uh, and it costs 750 euros for two nights. So there's a lot of money to be made um, by giving people the opportunity to get close in wild situations to animals such as brown bears and indeed wolverine was the other animal that I was very fortunate to see on that trip. Wolverines and bears will come to baited heights and it's definitely a growing burgeoning business and I think increasingly people want to experience the wild but at the moment you know we're having to go elsewhere in order to do that certainly in terms of large carnivores. With wolves, it's, it's much harder to do that. Um, wolves uh, are much more skittish at things like baited hides. And instead, the, the way of, of watching wolves and having kind of wolf tourism, if you like, in places like Yellowstone, in this photograph here, or in parts of Spain and Italy, is to use vantage points. It's a, a semi-open landscape with a wolf. The wolf pack is moving through it during the day. And there's a chance that you, if you're in the right place at the right time, you'll catch a glimpse of that, uh, that pack. And of course, at Yellowstone, as you know, telescopes and binoculars, and cameras, and people are using walkie-talkies and mobiles to communicate with one another and coordinate where the wolves are going to be and, and get to the right place at the right time. So you can do wolf tourism, uh, but it's not about baiting, it's about uh, vantage points. 
Now, the other uh, large carnivore, of course, uh, that we have in Europe, uh, Eurasian lynx, is completely different from either of these. You cannot do baited hides for Eurasian lynx. They don't, really don't come to bait. It's a very unreliable thing to do, and they're very unlikely to be wandering around semi-open landscapes like this in the middle of the day, waiting to be photographed by packs of people. It's just not what they do. They're far too shy, far too secretive. So it seems that lynx tourism is virtually impossible. I mean, really, you can give no guarantees, nothing like a guarantee about seeing lynx in the wild. So it, it, yeah, saying roll up, roll up, come and see the lynx, uh, that's not really gonna happen. However, there are ways in which lynx can contribute to nature-based tourism. And there's some fine examples of that from Germany, particularly in the German national parks. Now this photograph was taken um, in the Saxon Switzerland National Park which is in Germany's border with the Czech Republic. I was in a wee town called Bad Schandau, which is where the National Park Visitor Centre is. I followed little uh, signposts through the town that had little Lynx logos on the end of them, pointing towards the visitor centre. I saw the, the car park at the side of the building, which had National Park vehicles um, with big Lynx logos on the side. I got to the front of the building where you enter, as a 10 metre high banner with a Lynx on it, and you know, pretty impressive branding. You get inside into the visitor center and the shop is festooned with imagery of lynx you know it's it's posters and postcards and stuffed toys and t-shirts lynx are on everything it was really quite impressive the way that lynx were being used to market this national park to visitors and it works visitors are really interested in being somewhere uh, as wild and beautiful as this it must be what would be folks that's got a lynx and so I asked the staff uh, behind the counter if they happened to have any information about the lynx population in this national park, because I knew nothing about it. And uh, she leant across the, the counter conspiratorially towards me and said in a sort of hushed tone, we don't actually have any lynx in this national park. And I said, pardon? And they said, well, members of the public think they see them, but our rangers don't, we don't think we've got any, but it's really good at bringing in the tourists. And I was about to be appalled at this very cynical uh, attitude um, and fleecing tourists of their money. Um, but then I, I suddenly remembered that I'm from the Scottish Highlands, um, home of the Loch Ness Monster, and thought perhaps I should just keep Stum. But it does go to show that you can derive many of the benefits of having uh, links by not actually reintroducing any at all. Having said that, there are certainly some national parks, such as the Hearts Mountains National Park, where they have indeed reintroduced links, and, in, and indeed it is a big part of, of the viewer of the package to bring tourists from you know, the cities of Germany into this uh, forested landscape where they might, they know they probably won't, but they might catch a glimpse of the lynx and if they don't, well, they can come back again. But just being in that landscape where there's this wild and beautiful animal is enough. So that's how lynx could contribute to the nature-based tourism industry. And of course that is, nature-based tourism is a massive piece of the jigsaw here in Scotland, particularly in rural Scotland. So I've talked about an awful lot of other European countries. Um, what about the UK? Um, what about this whole subject of reintroduction? Can we even talk about reintroduction in the first place? Did we even have these animals in the past? Well, we know that we did because their bones have been found in limestone caves the length and breadth of the country from the north coast of Scotland right down to the south coast of England. We know they were here. And we used to think that they lived until about 4,000 years ago and succumbed to uh, natural climate change, in which case there's not really a much of an ethical argument for reintroduction. However, we now know from having radiocarbon dated more and more of these bones that they lived here for much more recently than 4,000 years ago. And this skull, by the way, you can see it in the uh, National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. It was found in the bone caves near Inchnadam in the Northwest Highlands. Um, and the bones from those caves were carbon dated and found to be only for the second century AD, the Roman times. And I was involved in the radiocarbon dating of bones from North Yorkshire. Similarly, another similar carbon date from about second century AD, but also another one from the early medieval period, sixth century AD. We know that they were here uh, in, in much more recent times. And having that understanding that they were here allows us to reappraise the cultural record. Uh, and when researching the, uh, the book, uh, I was really pleased to come across a reference in 15th century Welsh poetry uh, to an animal roaming around the hills of North Wales called the Llaubrich, the speckled lion. And the hair stood up in the back of my neck, so I thought, what on earth else is it going to be? 
than a lynx, particularly as the poem described how this animal was following the roebuck up into the higher ground in the summer months, taking advantage of the fresh growth. I thought, well, it's describing perfectly natural uh, lynx behaviour, following roe deer up into the mountains in the summer. Fantastic. So I, I'm pretty sure that lynx were with us uh, until perhaps the 15th century, certainly in North Wales. Uh, I would suggest they were certainly in the Scottish Highlands at the same time, because the Scottish Highlands has acted as a last bastion for all sorts of uh, British species, whether it's wildcats or pine martens or the eagles or wolves. Uh, they're almost certainly living in Scotland at that time and quite possibly for a bit longer. So who knows, they might have been with us uh, until as late as the 16th century. This, of course, is an animal that's very difficult to see at the best of time, uh, but when they're getting scarcer and scarcer and presumably shyer and shyer, you can imagine how easy it would be to miss the last few links before they eventually succumbed. So they were living in Britain much more recently than we used to think, but that's still Nevertheless, quite a bit um, earlier than other similarly uh, thinly populated mountainous parts of Central and Western Europe. So we know, for example, in 1800, they were still found in the Alps, the Massif from Prague, the Pyrenees, etc, etc. So why did they die out in places like the Scottish Highlands, it seems, quite a bit earlier than that? Well, uh, the evidence, I would suggest, is provided by our woodland history. Um, we've reduced woodland cover down to something like 4% by the time we get to the, the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, that's a, a vanishingly small amount of habitat for an animal such as a lynx, which really needs big, well-connected uh, wooded landscapes. We were definitely overexploiting the deer populations. All the British uh, roe deer were restricted to a, a small number of glens in the Scottish Highlands. Red deer were brought to very low numbers as well. So prey was scarce. Uh, and the habitat even scarce, and you can see how they have succumbed uh, to that deforestation, which happened more severely and earlier uh, in the British Isles than it did elsewhere in Europe. But of course, uh, you know, can we talk about reintroduction if it's still a deforested, deerless landscape? Well, you know, we have begun, we're well on the road to reforestation uh, in this country. Scotland has more than quadrupled its woodland cover over the course of the 20th century, and we're continuing to expand that forest. We're now about 19% woodland cover, which is still a long way short of the EU average. Um, it's about half the EU average, so we're still a relatively deforested country, but we're expanding that woodland cover all the time. And in fact, the, the woodland expansion targets uh, are going up all the time. So we're likely to see more and more woodland, and quite possibly more and more deer taking advantage of that woodland. So certainly there are some parts of Scotland that are very well wooded. And you know, it doesn't matter too much what kind of woodland it is. You know, the lynx don't care whether the trees are North American, such as a waterfall pine plantation or a Sitka spruce plantation. They don't care if the deer are Japanese, whether they're introduced seeker deer. It's all about cover and protein. That's the key thing. So I would say much of Scotland's woodland cover is suitable habitat for lynx these days. And I've hinted at it, you know, the deer populations have certainly recovered. Roe deer are much more numerous and more widespread now than they have been for centuries. Likewise with the red deer, I mean, of course, we've gained two non-native species as well, the seeker deer and the fallow deer. And at, you know, very high densities, these deer can cause problems. They can cause ecological problems, they can cause economic problems. So to put it into some context, um, Forestry and Land Scotland, the public agency that manages uh, one third of Scotland's woodland cover on behalf of the nation, is typically shooting something like 37,000 or 38,000 woodland deer every year. And the costs of uh, deer impacts on uh, the public forest sector amount to something like £5 million. That's the net cost to the public purse of having to manage deer populations, provide deer fencing, or, or indeed the, the, the damage that they cause to the timber crop itself. So, and of course, that's just the one third of woodland owned by the public sector. If we extrapolate that, then we're looking at something like £15 million. So it's a, a, a big cost uh, to be borne, the, the, the effects of having lots of deer in our woodland. And it may well be, that lynx might be, uh, be able to perform a, a, a free or at least low cost uh, deer management service to the tune of a six figure sum of money, six or seven uh, figure sum of money. So deer are much more numerous where, uh, and uh, there's a lot more habitat. In terms of quantifying that, 
part of my PhD research a number of years ago now, I looked at the amount of suitable habitat based on how lynx use a more fragmented landscape in Switzerland. I looked at the connectivity between patches. I examined the prey densities in these habitat patches to get a sense of how many lynx could be supported. And we have two habitat networks in Scotland. Uh, a smaller one in the southern uplands, which straddles the border into England at Kielder, which could support, based on prey density, is there something like 50 uh, lynx, although I suspect that population may well have gone up, the potential pop, uh, population may well have gone up uh, in response to rising deer populations in the time since. And then north of the central belt, where much of the human population lives around Edinburgh and Glasgow, we have a much larger habitat network covering the, the northern parts of Scotland, and where there's actually higher densities of prey, and you could support up to about 400 lynx uh, in this habitat network, in which they can fairly easily move around. And of course, woodland is increasing all the time, and it may well be that the deer populations, woodland deer populations, are increasing to take advantage of that. And there's been more recent modelling um, of lynx uh, habitat availability in Scotland by Tom Ovenden, and indeed there's been some research done by Johnson Greenwood in England and Wales uh, to examine uh, habitat suitability elsewhere. But certainly it seems the Scottish Highlands is capable of supporting the largest lynx population uh, in the UK, which at full capacity would be something like the fourth biggest lynx population in Europe if it was allowed to get to that full potential. So what sort of conflicts, if any, might we expect uh, in, in Scotland if lynx were to be reintroduced? What sort of relationships might they have with people? Well, I mentioned that in, in Europe, the number one conflict is about deer. Well, you know, in many European countries, deer hunting is a very populist activity. Many members of the public do it in their spare time. And very often in countries that have far fewer deer than we do. So, for example, in Norway, you're 60 times more likely to be a deer hunter than you are here in the UK. And of course, in Norway, their deer density, certainly compared to Scotland, are much, much lower. So you can see how there's quite a bit of competition between lynx and people for deer, uh, for recreational hunting of deer. But in Scotland, I would say the most culturally and most economically significant form of deer hunting uh, is deer stalking of red deer, typically in an open environment, typically where we're talking about groups of animal or herds of animal, and it's typically stags that we're most interested in. And of course, lynx don't want to be out in the open. They don't want to be approaching herds of animals and are not capable of taking down stags. So I don't see a huge amount of scope for conflict uh, certainly not in real terms, between lynx and people in Scotland around deer. Perhaps there's a, there might be a different story with regard to sheep. Uh, the UK, after all, has the largest sheep population in Europe. We have lots of them. But however, they do not uh, graze in huge numbers in woodland. It's not like Norway. The vast majority of our sheep are grazed in open pasture, typically in flocks. Uh, and the vast majority of our woodland contains no sheep. So I see much less scope for conflict than you might see, for example, in Norway. Nevertheless, I still think there is a risk that lynx will occasionally take, she uh, take sheep, and, and there's no use pretending that that won't happen, because I think it probably will. But I think if, if Switzerland's anything to go by, and I think it is, I think it will be small scale, localized, and potentially manageable. But that doesn't mean to say that there won't be a conflict about it. We know how these things work. Uh, but I, uh, I think that that is the issue that perhaps needs to be uh, addressed most uh, going forward if we do decide to have an extreme introduction or have a, a deeper discussion about the introduction. So I'm just going to finish up with uh, another one of Laurent's camera chat images of a lynx. This one is in Switzerland. So, you know, going forward in the future, might, might I, am, or indeed might you, get a lynx on your camera trap here in the UK or here uh, specifically in Scotland? Well, yeah, it's possible. Who knows what's going to happen? It's hard to see how lynx reintroduction is going to happen or are going to happen successfully if there's an awful lot of uh, polarised and ill-informed discussion and we're kind of loading hand grenades at each other from the trenches. If, however, we're prepared to have a respectful dialogue with the people who live and work in the countryside, listen to their concerns, try and address them, and perhaps maybe compromise a little bit, then maybe they can reach a mutually agreeable accommodation between the links and us. Oop, sorry. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm more than happy to take some questions. It's normally at this point, if I was in a, a hall, 
uh, I would, uh, after the questions and answers, I would race to a table at the back of the room and try and convince you to part with some good hard-earned cash for a copy of The Links and Us. Uh, this is it here. It's a 160-page hard hat book. It's very beautifully presented. I can see that because I didn't take any of the photographs or indeed the design, but it is a very nice book. I'm sure those of you who've got it will hopefully back me up on that one. So if you are at all interested in getting a signed or a personalised copy uh, of the book, I'm more than happy to sell you that. It's uh, £25 plus postage, which would typically be £4 here in the UK, obviously uh, more, depending if you're uh, outside the UK or not. But yeah, more than happy to do that. If you want to contact me about that, then you can get me on uh, LinkedIn, you can send me a message. If you're not on uh, LinkedIn, then you send me uh, uh, an email to dave.heatherington at top21.com. But um, I'm sure there are quite a few questions um, which I'm more than happy to attempt to try and answer. So I will now uh, stop sharing my screen. There we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, David. Uh, and yes, as you expected, there is the odd question or two uh, to cover off. Now, some of these uh, popped up early doors. And uh, as Rory had suggested, people can uh, vote or uh, suggest which ones they'd like answered. Some I think you've already covered off at later stages of your talk. So what I'll do is I'll go through uh, these as best I can. Uh, given that you're into overtime shortly, we're not going to be keeping you here till uh, midnight, although I'm, I suspect we could. So for anybody who doesn't get a question answered, apologies in advance. Uh, we'll try and get uh, responses to most of these uh, out in the public domain in some way, shape or form. So what I'll do is I'll filter through the list that I've got just now, picking out what I think uh, look as if they're the top questions that we've had so far. So a uh, question from Rob Jackson, uh, David, uh, it says, given the NFU's reluctance and their influence, what do you think are the chances of links being released in the near, and um, we've got kind of brackets, five to 10 years future? Well, uh, it, it's, I guess it's possible. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, with the way it is at the moment being pretty polarised and pretty politicised, it seems unlikely that uh, anybody's going to rubber stamp links reintroduction anytime soon, certainly in Scotland. Uh, I know that a trial reintroduction uh, in Kielder Forest, uh, just over the border in England, uh, came very close to being rubber stamped a couple of years ago by the, the English Environment Minister. Um, but at the last minute, uh, they decided not to do that due to concerns about the way that that particular project had handled consultation with uh, local uh, stakeholders. So, um, yeah, it's it's undoubtedly a, a sensitive issue. Um, perhaps some politicians are more happy to talk about it than others. Um, but I honestly have no idea how likely it is that whether it's going to happen in five, ten years, and that's a long time uh, for sure. Okay, thank you. So moving on, we've got a question, and uh, I see my screen scrolling away there, so apologies if I pause for a second. Uh, we've got uh, Laura Waistell, who's uh, working on her degree dissertation uh, on the behaviour of recently reintroduced Eurasian beaver in England. And she was wondering if there's any significant ecological interaction between the Eurasian beaver and lynx in their native ranges. No, I don't think there is any significant interaction, which isn't to say that, you know, uh, a lynx might not kill the odd beaver. Um, I mean, I know from countries such as Latvia, where there is a, a very healthy population of, uh, of beavers, and indeed where there's quite a few lynx, uh, and certainly wolves, that uh, wolves are quite a significant predator of beavers, um, but lynx generally not. Uh, I don't think it would have any significant population effect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh question from Keys Boxhorn, uh, who I think, like yourself, David, was blown away by the quality of the uh, camera trap footage there. Uh, have, have you got any details regarding the brand of wild camera that was used to capture those, those pictures? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't. Sorry, Keys. Um, there is actually, a, a, and this sounds like I'm mercilessly plugging the book again, which of course I am. Uh, but at the back of the book, there's, there's Laurent himself has penned two pages um, about how he goes about you know, getting photographs of links. I don't know whether it goes into the technical detail of what type of camera, but I suspect uh, it's not going to be a 50 quid job from Aldi. 
uh, that he's used. Uh, I think we're talking some serious kit and some serious money. Um, but if, if Keith is, uh, I think he might be connected to me on LinkedIn, I, I can certainly find out a little bit more and let him know uh, the message. We opportunity for some commission there, I feel, as well. So, okay, moving on. Uh, uh, again, I'm just I'm scrolling through some of these, so I will come back to some of the other ones. I just want to make sure that different people get an opportunity here uh, in terms of uh, getting their questions asked. So Colin Mills has asked, which groups do you think are most important to win over in terms of reintroduction? Uh, and he's suggesting, you know, politicians, conservation groups, farmer, public, public etc. Well, it's a good question, and it's not an easy question to answer. Um, I would I would hesitate to pick out particular groups because I think that there's a real danger that you then focus in on that group to the exclusion of others, which who I think are just as important. And you know, we live in a, a democratic society where everybody uh, has uh, you know a vote. So um, I think it's important to to engage with a, a broad suite of people in the in the country, both at the, at the wider public level and and more acutely at the local level. And I think, um, you know, if if local communities like the sound of, of links then, uh, and, and, and are at ease with it, then I think that uh, is probably, you know, the way forward. Um, but, yeah, I mean, certainly so far, the, the, the biggest concerns uh, about links reintroduction uh, in the UK have largely arisen from the agricultural sector, I would say. Um, possibly some from the sporting side that's largely agricultural. But of course, you know, there are lots of people who live in Britain, including lots of different people who live in the countryside who are not farmers. And, you know, I think it's important to engage with everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from uh, James, who's already uh, been popular. And uh, this question has got to top, top ratings so far. So uh, a question around about links prey. Would they take game birds? Well, you know, specifically focusing on the issue of grouse moors in Scotland and, you know, would that, you know, create, a, as he describes it, a Bermuda Triangle for predators? Uh, no, it's a good question. And, of course, we know that there are tensions in the countryside around predators at the moment, particularly around, um, the, the, there's a lot of public discussion about driven grouse moors uh, and predators. Um, you know, lynx, again, they don't really want to be out on an open moor trying to hunt birds, you know, especially in an environment that's, uh, you know, rammed full of deer. You know, we, we've got a lot of deer in this country, but there are some parts of Europe and indeed Asia where deer density is very, very low. And that's typically the, the very cold bits that have really harsh winters, you know, like the northern Nordics and, and Russia. Uh, deer are very low and the lynx in those instances are living at very low densities, but they are switching to smaller prey including things like, you know, uh, hares and small mammals, but they can occasionally take uh, grouse like black grouse and hazel grouse and, and capercaillie. Um, but environments further west in Europe where you've got a lot more deer, that is very rare behaviour. If you'll recall the, the league table I showed there with like one capercaillie, that is quite typical uh, for Western Europe, very low levels. So I don't an anticipate a, a real conflict, a real issue of, you know, lynx predating on birds on grouse moors. It's, it's just not where they want to be and what they want to be doing. Um, I suppose the one form of game bird that we have a lot of in a more woodland setting is, of course, pheasants. Um, and we typically have them reared and released in pens. And of course, when they're in a pen, it, it, it is possible to keep a lynx out of a pen. It's a pretty big beach. They're very agile, but you can adapt a pen to keep um, things like a lynx out. And certainly that's been done in some of the fallow deer farms in Switzerland where lynx are getting into pens. You can put uh, either a hot wire along the top or have a, a couple of wires leaning outwards and that really puts the links off. So you can keep uh, poults in a pen pretty safe. Uh, obviously when they're out of the pen, then they're, they're more vulnerable. Uh, but when I raised this whole issue with perhaps one of Europe's tops, uh, top experts on links, uh, he just felt it wouldn't be an issue in Scotland. Even though we have a lot of pheasants, they're really not interested in birds. It's the deer that they want. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from uh, David Bentley. Uh, very simply, have there been any attacks against humans recorded? That's, that's a good question, David. Um, there have. Now, this is an interesting thing. You'll, you'll, you'll very often hear how there have been no recorded attacks by links on people. That's not, strictly speaking, correct. There have. However, it's under very exceptional circumstances. It's when the links have got rabies, uh, and that's something that completely changes the links' behaviour. They have no fear of humans, and there has been a small number of cases from Eastern Europe, like uh, Croatia, and I think uh, Slovakia is another place, 
where um, I think it was woodcutters were approached by a rabid lynx that was heavily you know, emaciated. It was half the weight it would normally be because it just wasn't able to hunt properly and it lost its fear and was uh, approaching people. Uh, and I think in one instance, you know, somebody was bitten by it, but you know, got hospital treatment straight away and, and made a full recovery. And of course, in, in a UK situation, we would have intensive uh, quarantine. We wouldn't be importing animals that would have rabies. And it's very, very unlikely that there would be rabies uh, in, in, in this country. So, but ordinarily, a healthy lynx will stay well away from people. They know that people are bad news. So if you, for example, inadvertently or even deliberately came between a mother lynx and her kittens, she will back off. Uh, she's not going to mess with you. If your dog came between the mother and the kittens, it's a different story. She she will defend her kittens against the dog, um, but people, yeah, they're, they're very very nervous of people. Excellent, and that 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 point you make about rabies there, uh, David, uh, covers off nicely a question that Janet had asked in terms of the the potential for rabies introduction to to the UK uh, and transmission uh, via links population. So thank you for covering two two and one there. The questions ain't going away though, uh, so we'll uh, we'll see what we can do to pick off a few more uh, without uh, going over the top here. Again, another popular question is uh, again from James Byrne: do, do you think that European type green bridges or underpasses would significantly reduce roadkill? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, certainly we know from some parts of Europe that green bridges have been built and they they certainly have been effective. And um, I'm not sure that it's necessarily been shown to have a massive impact on links, uh, you know, especially. I know certainly there have been places where brown bears have benefited a great deal from green bridges in some parts of Europe and, and the underpasses um, that, uh, that are ne not necessarily um, built with wildlife in mind are used by other felids like bobcats, like Iberian lynx, like mountain lions. So I, I don't see any reason why Eurasian lynx wouldn't make use of either purpose-built green bridges or just um, large culverts that are that can be fairly um, cheaply uh, adapted to make them more attractive to wildlife, either by using fencing to funnel the animals towards them, perhaps having more greenery around them. We do know that, that feeders will use things like underpasses and overpasses, and it, it, it may well help, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, it would be remiss of me not to uh, pick up on uh, the wee plug for your book here. So we have a question which links nicely into that. Uh, if I could just uh, find it again, my screen has scrolled away from me. Uh, just give me two seconds. Uh, yeah, okay. So it's from Curtis Toy. Uh, he's already uh, got your book, read it and loved it. Uh, he's asking if you've got another sequel or another project in the works. And part two of that question, what can we do as mere mortals to help with the reintroduction of the links in Scotland? Wow. OK, uh, well, thanks, Curtis. Uh, and I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Um, I'm really pleased about that. Uh, the feedback has been uh, it's been overwhelmingly positive from, from those people that have fed back to me. Maybe the ones who really hated it don't speak to me again. I don't know. Um, but I'm glad Curtis uh, liked it. In terms of another project, uh, possibly. I, I'm doing a lot of reading at the moment. Uh, quite what the output is going to be, I don't know. Uh, it might end up being a book, um, but I'm certainly reading a lot of books about Scotland's natural history in centuries gone by. So I'll be interested to see uh, where that ends up. Hopefully it does end up in a book, but it's not going to appear tomorrow on the bookshelves, that's for sure. Um, and what can mere mortals do? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think being as, as well informed about links as you can and, and you know, uh, and, and taking that um, information and awareness you have about links into, into a sort of respectful discussion with people about it is, is a really useful thing to do. Um, there are certainly uh, NGOs out there who are very interested in, in the idea of, of uh, links reintroduction. I won't name them because I'll probably get into hot water. Um, so I'm sure there are various ways that people can get involved. Uh, but I would say that Curtis uh, has done the right thing. He's, 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 he's making himself as well informed as he can be about links. And I think that's a good place to start. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, question from Lisa. And it's a topic that uh, I see has appeared on a, a few of the questions uh, on the board here. Uh, Lisa Hutchinson says there are several areas in northern Scotland where wild boar roam freely. Uh, uh, what interaction would you expect between uh, the lynx and wild boar? Yeah, good question. Um, 
Lynx can uh, kill wild boar, typically young wild boar. Um, it's not something they make a habit of. Um, after all, tampering with a sound of a wild boar is something you don't do lightly, particularly if you've got a very protective mother or indeed a tusker, you know, the, the big males. Uh, I would say uh, a 20 kilo lynx has to be very careful what it's doing with those guys. Um, but, you know, there are studies that show that they have taken the uh, young boarlet. Uh, they're not going to mess with the big uh, boar very often at all. And, and we know from some parts of, of Europe that boar, particularly adult boar, do push lynx off uh, deer carcasses. So there, there is that form of uh, interaction as well. I think, again, a bit like the beavers, I think the wolf is probably a more effective predator of wild boar. We know that they do kill quite a lot of wild boar because, of course, the wolves are very often a social hunter. Uh, they're the bigger animal for the start, 48, 45 kilos, and there could well be six, seven, eight of them. So you can imagine how they are, are much more likely to be taking out wild boar. Um, so, yeah, uh, when it comes to prey for lynx, it's, it's really about um, things like roe deer, chamois, you know, the, your kind of small to medium sized woodland deer, uh, and then occasionally taking out things like foxes. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious of time here, David, and you've uh, you've been talking an awful lot, and it's pretty exhausting work, uh, you know, covering off everything that you've done. I think we're probably looking at, you know, maybe about another four or five questions to take us up till nine, if you're okay with that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, Sam Rose. Uh, Asked a question. Now, it may have been covered off in your talk, and to be perfectly honest, uh, I was trying to juggle screening some of the questions, so my apologies in advance if you sort of answered this one. But Sam's asking, uh, what would you say is a minimum number for a viable and sustainable breeding population of lynx, and at what density? Gosh, um, well, good question, and I probably should have mentioned that. Um, I would say that well, it, it depends how much of a, an element of risk you want to accept uh, in terms of the, the risk of extinction um, going forward. You know, you know, and I modelled it in my PhD. I think it was a hundred years with a five percent risk of extinction. Uh, and, and as I recall, you're, you're probably looking at a minimum viable population of something like 200, maybe 250 animals, which would suggest that in the highlands, uh, with the, the potential for 400 lynx, that you would easily exceed that minimum viable population. Whereas in the south of Scotland, you'd be struggling to hit that. But of course, you know, if you're prepared to accept a little bit more risk, you know, 10% risk, then you know, suddenly a, a, a much smaller population becomes viable. And of course, you can uh, manage a population quite intensively. You could decide, right, well, we're going to have a small area of habitat, a small population of lynx, ordinarily left its own devices. That might not be viable by itself in the long term. But what we're going to do is we're going to bung in a fresh lynx every you know, five, 10 years and keep it ticking over genetically. Uh, so it does come down to how much you're, the risk you're willing to accept and how much you're willing to meddle with it. Um, but I would say uh, 200, 250 links, uh, you know, if you've got that uh, in the long term, that, that's that's probably pretty safe. Assuming, of course, that your founder stock uh, is genetically well mixed, you, you, you certainly don't want to start off with a very small founder population that's all closely related or comes from a population that has a very low genetic variability. So, for example, I would suggest don't take uh, a founder population from Norway or Sweden, despite the geographical proximity in, in many ways, and goodness knows I'm, I'm making comparisons with Norway all the time in, in, in my day job when I'm talking about woodland. But uh, the, if you'll remember the map, the, the lynx population in Norway and Sweden got down to a very small number and it was isolated on a peninsula. So the genetic variation in Norway and Sweden is very low. Whereas in Finland, um, and indeed places like Latvia and Estonia, although they were very rare in the past and might even have been completely extirpated in those countries, uh, they were replenished by a massive population next door in Russia. So there's much greater genetic variability. So genetic variability is an important thing as well to consider. Yeah. We have a couple of questions here, uh, David, along the lines of uh, behavioural adaptation from two different people, but I'm going to merge them into one. So we've got Ian Maynard and Colin Gilfoyle. Uh, Ian's asking if is there behavioural adaptation by the lynx when reintroduced to areas where there's human activity and Colin is asking would the lynx adapt to using other habitats in Scotland that are not as common in Europe such as heather moorland if there's suitable prey there? Yeah, both uh, good questions. Um, in terms of adapting behaviour in more human environments, I mean, I would say, and again, I don't necessarily have data to, to back this up, but it seems logical 
that if you're uh, if the links are living in landscapes that are busy being used by people there's a lot of recreation going on there's a lot of you know um, land management activity you can imagine how that links population would become a lot more nocturnal uh, it's going to start using the landscape at times of day when we're more likely to be safely tucked up in bed and they'll pretty much have the place to themselves um, uh, so yeah i could see that being one adaptation um, Colin uh, asked a good question about uh, using alternative habitats, uh, and of course, you know, at this point in time, you know, the early 21st century, we based, uh, I certainly I based my assumptions on lynx habitat used for, based on, on how lynx are using uh, modern Europe today. Who knows, you know, as the population continues to grow and expand, and maybe as human behaviours change, it might be um that that links do uh, start to change their behavior uh, and, and you know and that's not something that we're necessarily terribly aware of at the moment and so not been factored into the modeling for scotland in terms of heather moorland well yeah possibly um particularly if that moorland uh, that sort of the heather is particularly leggy and can hide the animal and they can feel uh, secure and concealed then perhaps they could um but it's it's there's nothing to indicate that yet that that's what they're likely to do I should say that from parts of Central Asia, uh, where lynx do occur, they are occurring in landscapes there where there's very little in the way of woodland cover and they're using scrub and rocks, you know, boulder scree. Uh, that's what they're using as cover to take out things like mountain goats and mountain sheep, you know, wild species like that. So they will make use of whatever covers available. So it's possible uh, that they could start to use more scrubby habitats in, the in this country, but there's been certainly not much of having any indication from Europe that that's what, they'll, what they would do or do do at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, a couple more to round up then. Uh, Elwyn Suter is asking, is there any credible evidence of lynx being illegally released or escaping in the UK in recent years? Aye, uh, that's a good question. Um, so there's certainly plenty of evidence of lynx have been illegally released in other parts of Europe. Um, so for example, the Hearts Mountains um, National Park, when they first did that, uh, the introduction, they did it um, with a small budget. So they didn't have uh, money for radio collars and whatnot, till that sort of scientific, the expensive scientific kit. So they released zoo-born animals um, into the landscape, and and after a few years, they got more budget. Felt like, well, we'll start recapturing some of these links. We'll put collars on them, and it was when they were doing that that they found that uh, at least two of the links that recaptured had nothing to do uh, with the initial release, and indeed had redundant zoo microchips under their fur, so they certainly weren't born in captivity either. So it does show that illegal releases do happen. In terms of the UK, and in terms of Scotland, yeah, it's possible. Um, I know there was a, a rash of, of sightings, and indeed some people were even claiming to have done it, uh, of, of links in the southern uplands and the borders uh, in Scotland about um, 20 years ago. Whether that lynx population was indeed ever released, uh, I suspect it could well have done, but whether it's actually come to anything, whether it still persists, I don't know. I've not heard anything much about it at all in the last few years, which would probably suggest it's, it's kind of dwindled away. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, our final question for the evening. Uh, and what I'll say, I'll, I'll speak to Rory afterwards and see if we can capture any outstanding ones and see if there's a mechanism to potentially, uh, you know, get answers out for those if possible. But uh, our final question is from Anony Mouse, uh, whoever that may be. And uh, that question is, could links aid in encouraging deer movement and impact on forest cover as a result? Well, in many ways, that's the million dollar question uh, is exactly what impact would links have on deer populations and, and consequently, what impact would that then have on things like uh, well, tree growth in particular, which is something that is undoubtedly going to become more and more important um, in the future. We're, we're planting more and more forest, um, whether it's for timber, whether it's for carbon, whether it's for biodiversity or indeed all of those things. So yes, um, I would say that the evidence from Europe is that uh, a high density woodland deer population is unlikely to be significantly reduced by uh, just having reintroduced links. Um, where you've got a fairly low density deer population and you have links, then they can have a significant impact. They can take a significant proportion of that deer population. But the, the, the bigger the deer population, the higher density is than that, the less able the links are to um, push that down to low levels that would necessarily uh, eat uh, natural regeneration. 
which doesn't mean that in tandem with other mortality factors such as shooting or indeed harsh winter weather, and there's certainly evidence from Switzerland that the combination of increased culling by people combined with harsh winter weather and lynx predation did have a very significant impact on roe deer and chamois numbers uh, and, and indeed densities. And you could see how that certainly could have an effect, uh, an effect on vegetation uh, at least for as long as that, that deer population is at a low level. It might allow tree, a pulse of tree regeneration to get away. Thanks very much, David. Okay, uh, well, as I suggested, I think we're going to draw a line under it there. I would like to say a personal thanks to all of the participants who have joined in to, to, to watch this fantastic presentation tonight. Uh, we've got 186 bodies still with us. Uh, David, you're looking as fresh as a daisy from the minute we started speaking at seven, so I'm seriously impressed. Uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to, to, to you personally for what is a really fantastic, thought-provoking talk. Uh, I think it's very easy easy for, for everyone to see why you're in such big demand and I think uh, it's been a real treat to, to, to finally uh, hear, hear your words here. So, uh, you know, for myself, on behalf of the Clarkson East Bride branch, the Glasgow branch of SWT, a huge thank you and also on behalf of everybody who's out there who I can't see at the moment, but uh, thank you very much for a, a really outstanding talk. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you.